Let's give the worship team another hand if you don't mind. Thank you for worshiping along with them. Uh, good morning. How's everybody? Good, 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 good. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, real quick, raise your hand if you were here last week. All right, good, good. Y'all probably, I'm, y'all gonna have an exercise, like whole routine by the time we're done with this sermon today, so just get ready, just get the hands ready. Uh, so you were here last week, uh, I was too, and uh, Ronnie spoke out of Ecclesiastes and uh, basically talked about how uh, finishing is better than starting in that verse. And what he talked about was that um, we've had, you know, this first half of the year, we've just, we've seen a lot of life change, you know, and uh, we've seen a lot of things happening in the church um, that are exciting. And he challenged us, though, for the second half of the year. Y'all remember that? Am I making this up? Okay, he challenged the second half, half of the year to work smarter and, and uh, to, you know, not, not sit back and cruise, but to see it through to the end of the year. And that got me to thinking a lot about the church. And I, got, I thought a lot about this first half of the year and some things that I've seen. And uh, I was thinking a lot about what's to come. And... There is something that I noticed, probably more, I guess, in this first half of the year. I probably noticed it more than I ever have at Golden Corner Church. And it's something that I know we need to see more of if we're going to do what God has called us to do. If we're going to make a difference in the lives that God is calling us to make a difference in. And so I, I, would, I would kind of describe it as like a gently sweeping culture in our church. And uh, in order to talk to you about it, though, I have to tell you a story out of the Bible. But before I do that, uh, raise your hand if you would like to see God continuing to work at Golden Corner. Okay, good. Did anybody see anybody without their hand up? Okay. All right. Uh, Raise your hand if you would like to see lives, uh, lives changed regularly at Golden Corner. Okay, good. All right. Raise your other hand. See, I've got to work out. You got to alternate, guys. Uh, if you would like to see Jesus be the focal point of this community. Okay, good. I'm going to remember you said that. Okay? It's important to me that you said that. And I'm glad that you all raised your hands. Uh, so I need to tell you this story, though. And this story is found in Acts chapter 9. And we're going to be in verses 36 and 42. And for some of you, I know you just thought to yourself, man, that's, one, two, three. that's only six verses. This sermon is going to be short today. No, sir. Uh, Sorry, I just wanted to go ahead and just nix that. Um, Raise your hand if you've ever studied Tabitha before in the Bible. I see some of you, some of you already raised your hands early. Raise your hands if you studied Tabitha in the Bible. Okay, good. I got one or two. That's exactly what I expected. It's a short story. It's just six verses in the Bible, her story is. And I'm sure that that's probably why, it, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's easy to gloss over it. Uh, but this is at the very beginning of the church. Okay, so Jesus has ascended. Peter has preached and thousands have become saved. And now the church is really picking up steam. That All of the disciples are sharing the gospel. Uh, other people are now beginning to share the gospel. And the church is growing quickly. It's almost like a wildfire, completely out of control. The church is growing city to city. It's just moving. And we're going to be talking about the city, or we're going to be talking, our story takes place in the city of Joppa, which is the port city of Jerusalem. And we don't know how believers came to be there, yet there were believers in the city of Joppa. So verse 36, the first half of it, there was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek, when, which in Greek is Dorcas, Paul's. Tabitha in Greek is Dorcas. Do y'all understand the theological ramifications of that? Tabitha is Dorcas. Let's all say that together. Ready? Tabitha is Dorcas. God loves me. My sister's name is Tabitha. Do you know how valuable this information would have been when I was a kid? This is why you get your kids in the Word. I look, I was, when I saw that, when I read that the other day, I looked and I said, Dorcas. That, that can't be how it's pronounced. I look it up, the YouTube video pronunciation, Dorcas, Dorcas. I thought, God loves me. If I ever wondered, he loves me. So Tabitha is Dorcas. Y'all need to remember that, okay? 
<laughs> She's in the back. She don't even know this is happening. This is the description of the Tabitha in the Bible, though, the rest of verse 36. She was always, right? Was that word? Always doing what? Kind things for others and what? So the description of Tabitha is very, very clear. This, I mean, this is big. This is big for the Bible to say this about her. Wouldn't you agree? The Bible describes you as someone who is always doing kind things and always helping the poor. That's awesome. That's a very cool thing. Verse 37, about this time she became ill and died. Well, that's over. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. Uh, I don't know who, uh, it's, it's almost like this was written by a writer of The Walking Dead. I mean, it's, we're introduced to her and then she's dead. Um, Tabitha, the person who was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor, is dead. Verse 38, but the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda, so they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. Now, we've got to stop here for just a second. You've got to see this. You understand what just happened? It said, but the believers, so the believers, all these other believers, apparently something's going on. They heard that Peter was nearby. The town of Lydda is 10 miles away from Joppa. They hear that Peter's over there. He just, he's performing miracles. He's leading people to Christ. They hear that he's there. And it says they send two men to what? To beg him, please come as soon as possible. Hmm. Maybe it was out of desperation or maybe it was because uh, they just, they needed, they felt like they needed Peter to be there with them during this time. But for some reason, they asked Peter come, to come. And in verse 39, apparently the two men begging did a good job. They did a good, a good job begging. And so in verse 39, so Peter returned with them. And as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. Now, this is the room where Tabitha is, where her body is. And it says the room was, what's that word? All right, we have to say it together and with passion, people. The room was what? Filled. Okay, good. The room was filled. What was it filled with? It was filled with widows who were weeping and showing him the coats and the other clothes Dorcas had made for them. All right, I want you to stop for a second. I want you to listen. I, this is visualization time, okay? This is imagination time. I don't know exactly how this went, but Peter, he, he leaves. It's a 10-mile trip. He gets there, and I, I think Peter's kind of walking in like, what is going on? Who is this person? What, why? You know, everyone's mourning. He gets up there, and it says this room is filled with widows and with poor people. And he looks, and I, and I just imagine he goes, he kind of looking at some, maybe one of the guys that brings him, he goes, who was this? And the widows began to tell him who she was. I imagine this first widow comes up and she said, look, this is the coat that I have on. She made this for me. I didn't ask her to. She made this for me. And another widow comes up or another poor person comes up and they said, look, these, look at these blankets. She made all of these blankets for me. And one after another, and I believe with all of a heart that I'm not taking any liberties here because the Bible said that she had done all sorts of kind things, right? That's what it, always doing kind things. But I believe that one after another, they began to tell stories of all that Tabitha had done for them, all of the things that she had made for them, all of the sacrifices that she had done for them, all of the tasks that she had performed and all the gifts she had given and all the time she had spent helping them. You see this in the story, right? Shake your head yes at me. Now, apparently it was, it was moving one after another. After They came up and just told stories. And apparently it, it moved Peter. And so in verse 40, we pick up the story. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed. I want to stop right here. You know what Peter's doing? He's following in Jesus' footsteps right here because it wasn't that long ago that Peter watched Jesus do exactly this same thing. Jesus emptied the room. Peter emptied a room. Jesus knelt and prayed. Peter knelt and prayed. He prayed and then he turned, turning to the body, he said, get up, Tabitha. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. That's a little scary, isn't it? He gave her his hand. He helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the believers and he, and he presented her to them. What's that word? 
alive. The news spread through the whole town. And many believed in the Lord. Many come to believe in the Lord. Like Peter had watched Jesus do, he emptied the room and it says he knelt and he prayed. And I thought about this a lot all week. I was like, man, what did, I wonder what he said. You know, what is it he prayed uh, for God to do this? I mean, this is incredible. And, and I'll be honest with you, after all week, I, I, it kind of dawned on me that I, I think it was probably pretty simple. I don't think it was a complicated prayer. You know what I think? You know what I think he said? It's just me. I think Peter knelt and said, God, you know this woman. And all these people are crushed that she's gone. If you see fit, I think you should raise her from the dead. And I think in his heart, Peter knew that that prayer had been answered. Maybe he heard a little gasp of air, he heard something. And he looked at Tabitha and he said, Get up, Tabitha. And she got up. Pretty cool story, isn't it? Can be a pretty, yeah, I think so too. It's a pretty cool story in six verses. You say, okay, Tim, you said you saw something in the story that's happening at GCC right now. You said it's been happening. You say you, you would like to see it happening more that needs to be happening more. What is it? What is it in this story that I was supposed to see? Is that the question you have for me? Say yes. Okay, here it is. An average person Sharing their little gifts can make a big difference. Hang on. An average person sharing their little gifts can make a big difference. Don't just hear that and begin to discount it. Listen to me. An average person sharing their little gifts can make a big difference difference. Did you see that in the story? Did you see that in the story? Let's start from the beginning. An average person. Who is Tabitha? Okay, let me tell you what she wasn't. She wasn't a prophet. She wasn't a celebrity. She wasn't a politician. She wasn't rich or wealthy of some kind. She wasn't a teacher of any kind. She didn't have power or authority. As a matter of fact, the Bible describes her as simply as anybody could ever be described. You know what it says? She was a believer. You know what Tabitha was? Tabitha was an average, ordinary, everyday person who had come to believe in Jesus Christ. That's who she was. She was an average person. The second part, an average person sharing their little gifts. What did she do? What had Tabitha done? What did it talk about in the story? The Bible says it very plainly that Tabitha had done kind things. Right? Isn't that what it said? It's very plain, very simple. She had done some kind things. She had helped others. The specific uh, gift mentioned in this story is apparently Tabitha was a talented seamstress. Okay? Or she had experience as a seamstress, maybe. I don't know, but that is what she did. That was one of her gifts that she was given. She could make clothes, and she could make coats, and she could do all of those things. That's what she did. The Bible keeps it very simple right here. This was a believer who did some kind stuff. Who went out of her way to help others. Who shared her gift. That's the way the Bible describes it. You know how I think it looked. Can I, just, can I go through this with you? Because sometimes I think we just kind of like, oh, she made clothes. Do you understand? Like, this is probably some, some hint of the way it was. Tabitha lived her life looking for people in need. And I believe with all of my heart that she would, she would go around and she was looking. And maybe it was somebody, somebody would tell her about somebody else who was in need. Or maybe she would see somebody out there on the street or whatever. She would see somebody and she, and I believe Tabitha was this gifted. I believe she could look and she'd kind of look at what they needed. And she could tell that they needed clothes or they needed a coat. And I believe she could size them up. You know what I mean? Like she was good enough to just kind of size them up. I think she probably even went beyond that and she thought fabric and she thought eye color and I mean probably all that stuff that people can do. I don't know. And uh, I think she looked at them and I think she saw it and then I think she went home or went to the store and got everything that she needed and then she 
cut and trimmed and sewed and made and pieced together. And then she took that gift that she had made and she wrapped it up and she took and she found that person again and she handed it to them. I think that's what it looked like. She was an average person sharing a little gift. Did she make a big difference? Did she make a big difference? You saw what the Bible said. What was the room? Say it with passion. Filled. The room was filled with people. Story after story, I believe, the crowd, I believe there were crowds even outside. Mourning her death. They had attended in droves to mourn the loss. They were a mess at her passing. As a matter of fact, they were so distraught that they sent word to the leader of the church at that time, to Peter. Do you understand that, how, like, how big a deal that is for these group of believers to think like, this is so bad, we are so sad, this is, we, we need help to go and to send somebody after Peter and say, bring him here, maybe he can do something to help us because we are crushed that this woman is gone. You see that? That's how much they were affected by it. I believe Peter was even moved by the turnout and the stories. He was moved at how inconsolable they were because it was a testament to the difference that this woman had made in all of these people's lives. This was an average woman who shared a gift she had to help others. And she did it at such a frequency and with such an intensity and so sacrificially that it had affected an entire community of people. Did you hear that? This is an average woman who shared a gift and she did so at, with such a, at such a frequency and with such an intensity and so sacrificially that an entire community of people were destroyed that she was gone. Every single time I get the chance to speak, you know, on a little Tim insight here, the most stressful part is naming it. <laughs> naming the sermon or the series. I don't know why that is. I think it's just my nature. But I just feel like it, you know, the name matters so much. You know what I mean? It says everything. You know, you kind of want to, you want to hint the sermon, but not just give the sermon away. And you know what I mean? But you want it to be clever. And like, seriously, it's just the way I am. So, so this week, I always, I always go and kind of open it up. And I t went to the creative team and I said, hey, guys, I said, uh, um, I, need, I need some help. You know, this is the message. This is where I'm leading, you know, the next two weeks. And this is what I kind of want to talk about. I need some help naming it. And they're so helpful. And they were like, okay, yeah, we'll think about it. So the last time I heard from them was Saturday morning, yesterday morning. I got a text and it said, uh, hey, what you naming your sermon? And, um, <laughs> you know, can't find good help these days, you know. And uh, so anyway, that was, it was, it was, uh, I was doing the barn and, uh, and man, I, as I was doing the barn, I was thinking about this story. I was thinking about, to be honest with you, I was thinking about Tabitha. And um, I was thinking about Tabitha, and I was thinking about us, and I was thinking about what we're supposed to do and who we're supposed to be. And, and I, man, I'll be honest with you, it's like God spoke to me, and God said, well, Tim, you know what Tabitha was. And I said, well, what is she? He said, she's a re-gifter. I said, a re-gifter? Yes. Yes, God, that is what she is. Raise your hand if you know what regifting is. Okay, good. Now listen, re listen here. Regifting has a negative connotation, okay? And I'm going to tell you why, because y'all all regift junk. Okay? And that's on y'all, okay? But I believe, listen to me, I believe that regifting is in fact a beautiful thing. I believe that. And in case you don't know, re gift is when you get something and maybe you've got two of them, maybe you don't need it, or maybe this is a potential that you see that this thing that you have, that somebody else could use it more than you or that it might help somebody else. And so you take and what do you do? You re gift it, right? Tabitha was a re gifter. She had a gift that she was given, and that was in a skill and an. And an and an ability, but she also had other things, I believe, in her life. And what she did was she took those gifts that she was giving, uh, given, and she re-gifted them to other people. She's a re-gifter. 
Right? Do you understand that that is what we are supposed to do? That is who we're supposed to be as Christians. That is, we are supposed to be re-gifters. The call of Christ is that we be a re-gifter. Here's the choice that we have. We can take a skill or an, or an ability we were given, just like Tabitha, and we can choose to share that gift with other people and, and provide something that they need, help them in some way. You understand that? We can take resources or material things that we have been given, that God has given us, and we can take and we can actually share those with other people who are in need. Do you understand that? Who could use them? We can take time that we've been given, and we can take that time because time is a gift, right? Have you ever, I mean, there's posts on Facebook all the time about it. You know, time is a gift. Well, I'm telling you, you can take the time that you've been given, and you can actually use it for somebody else. That's a choice that we have. You can take the blessings in your life that God has bestowed on you. And I want to stop for just a second because I know exactly what's happening because it's, what the, it's just what happens, and that is... Our minds tend to go to starting to thinking about money. And some of you are starting to shut me off because you think that's what I'm talking about. And some of you are starting to go, man, I don't think, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have nothing or whatever. Don't shut this out. There are blessings in your life that are not material things, that are not tangible things, not things you can necessarily put your hands on. But I'm telling you, it was given to you so that you could share it with God. So that you could share it with others. It's what we're supposed to do. I said it was a choice, and I'm not. That's true. That's a choice. But we're supposed to be regifters. We're supposed to be the master regifters. Because when we regift, when we take things that we've been given and we give them to other people, you know what happens? They make a big difference. They make a big difference in the lives of other people. They make a big difference in this world. Do you know why? Can I tell you why? Can we talk about this a little bit more? Let me tell you why they make a big difference. Number one, I have three reasons. Number one, it's personal. First of all, it's personal. Regifting is a personal act. This is because because this is what has happened. If it, it, when you regift, when you take and you share your gifts with other people, what happens is is that means that you're somebody and you're walking around and but you're you're looking out and you recognize that there is a need. And someone else, right? So I'm looking at an individual and I see they need this. This is something that they need. And then I look within myself and I recognize that I have the ability, I have the resources, I have what they need. Now I've got a decision to make. And when you choose to give and to share, do you you know what happens? This transaction between two people. This transaction between two. I mean, it is a beautiful thing. It's personal. I saw you, so I am giving to you. It's personal. And I don't care what anybody says. When it's personal, it means more. It makes a bigger difference when it's personal. When it's intimate like that. You see it? You know another reason it makes a big difference? Number two, it's rare. It's just rare. Now, I know when I say it, it sounds menial. It sounds like such a simple point. I know, I know that there are minds in here that, that think that. It sounds like such a menial thing. Okay, an average person sharing a small gift. I hear you, Tim. It's, it sounds like a menial, mundane thing. But the truth is, it's rare. It may be a little thing, but it's rare. I don't know what people were like back then, but I'm assuming that people are pretty much similar today. I'm assuming that people are lining up to help the widows and the orphans and the poor about as much as they are today. Most people, this is not how they live. Most people, we love to use our gifts to benefit ourselves. Maybe we get a little bit of money and the first thought is, what am I going to spend this on? 
we have some nice stuff and we try our best to make sure we're enjoying it. We get some time and it's all about how we're going to spend our time on ourselves. Maybe we have a skill or a certain skill or a certain ability and we go, man, how can this get me paid? Maybe for a lot of us we have something truly special that you can't just wrap your arms around. We have something truly special, but it just makes us more protective of it. And we cling to it even tighter. It's rare. It's so rare that I bet you've already thought of somebody that this reminded you of. But it's probably not a lot of people. You know the third reason it makes a big difference? I believe with all my heart, God loves it. God loves an average person sharing a little gift. I believe it with all my heart. He loves it. I mean, it, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not one to like take God's things, but it has to be one of his favorite things. It has to be one of his favorite things. You know why? Because you see it throughout the Bible. Jesus, what did he do when a little boy brought him two fish and, and five rolls? What did he do? Fed 5,000 men and their families. That's what he did. That is a perfect example of this story as well. It's throughout the Bible you see it. God loves when average people share their small gifts because it enables him to do great, big, magnificent things. But I want to tell you, you know how I know he loves it? Just in this story, if I was to just take this text and I just said, I'm going to show you how I know he loves it. He brought her back to life. Now, I believe with all of my heart that God responded to Peter's faithfulness. I know that's true. But I'll tell you something else. God responded to Tabitha's faithfulness as well. Her faithfulness to take care of the least of these. To share her life endlessly with others. To sacrifice the things that she had been given so that other people would have it. That's why God brought her back to life. I believe God looked down from heaven and he said, you know what? They could use some more of that. I'll let her go back. I'll let her do some more work. Um, this is what we're supposed to do. This is who we're supposed to be. Can I uh, tell you an example I saw recently? I've seen several, and I thought of several, but there was one this, one, this one was different. It caught me off guard, honestly. And it caught me off guard how moved I was. Um, one of the nights after Kids Week, we went and ate at Puerto Nuevo. And uh, it was uh, the Paines, which is Jason, Stacy, and Elise. And they have a son, Bryce, but he wasn't there. And the Blacks, and I can't remember who all else was there. And uh, so we were all eating, and it was late at Puerto, okay? We were shutting her down, all right? And uh, I'll tell you how late it was at Puerto, because you know, I know like, about everybody eats there. And we were in the big room, and there was just two other ladies in there. That's how quiet it was. So we're eating, or, or about to, or we're actually starting to get our food right at this, at, kind of at this moment. And um, all of a sudden, to kind of hear a, a commotion, you know, and look, and kind of some yelling, and then laughing, and then clapping, and look, and two guys, uh, our boys, really middle school, high school age, are coming around the corner, and they are, what I would say, uh, hooping it up, okay? And uh, they're coming to the table, and the pains kind of, they had their backs to them, the pains kind of turned out a look, and the pain started jumping up, and I'm kind of freaking out, like, what's happening right now, you know? And uh, they're, come, they're running over here, and, you know, I'll say that it was um, recognized kind of immediately that the two boys were, were special needs. And they came up, but they all started greeting each other, and they had the biggest grins you've ever seen, ever. And they were so excited to see the pains. 
And Jason jumped up and he hugs them. And uh, uh, Stacy turns around and stands up and she hugs, starts hugging them. One of them, I mean, they're kind of running around. One of them runs over to Elise and starts high fiving Elise, yelling, This is my best friend. And uh, they all start talking. And I mean, we're, we're getting food and y'all know the chaos that that can be, uh, you know. And they're all talking and hugging and laughing. And before I know it, Stacy's asking them about all their lives and who, what's been going on and talking, naming people and talking about this. And Jason's talking about WWE wrestling with one of the boys and talking about their favorite characters. And everybody, everybody is involved. And Lisa's up talking and playing. They're asking where Bryce is. And I'll be honest with you, I was absolutely moved. I welled up with tears. And I just sat there and I'm like, golly, I mean, these people love each other. And of course, they talked for a while and then they left and we started eating. Thank goodness I was about to die. <laughs> and uh, afterwards, I asked Stacy, I said, how do y'all know them? I assume Stacy works for schools. I, I assume maybe Stacy had worked with them at some point or something. And uh, she said, oh, Bryce brought them and they sat with us at a football game one night. I said, do what? And she said, yeah, Bryce brought them, and they sat with us at a football game one night, and, and we've just really grown to love them and everything else. And I, that's what this is. It struck me as I prepared this sermon that the reason I was so moved was I, what I had witnessed was I had witnessed an average person sharing small gifts, making a big difference. The love that was between them was unbelievable. And you say, well, Tim, what were they sharing? The Paynes got a lot of gifts, man. The Payne family does. They got compassion and friendliness and the gift of gab, if you've ever been around them. They got that. I'm not scared to say that. But I'm going to tell you the gift that they shared. This is what hit me. They're a family that loves one another. They have a strong love in their family. And you know what they've done with that gift they've been given? They share it. They adopt people. They bring them in. One after another. You know how I know? Uncle Tim. An average person sharing a little gift can make a big difference. That's the choice we have. All these things you've been given, that's your choice. Now I want to say, I'm, I'm, I got two things. Action steps. That's what we call them. Number one, as I went through this, as I described Tabitha, as I made this point, some of you immediately thought of somebody who's made a big difference in your life. You thought of an average person who has shared some little piece of themselves with you. They've given to you. And because they chose to do that, they made a big difference. Raise your hand if you could think of that person. I'm going to challenge you to do something. Thank them. Today. Thank them. That's one of the ways we make sure it happens more. Thank them. Do not miss out on the opportunity to go point out and say, I know this is what you did. I recognize that what you did was take something that God gave you and shared it with me. And I want you to know that it made a big difference in my life. Will you do that? Or right, something else? There's some of you here, and as I went through this story, this absolutely scared you to death. And you know that's not what you do. That doesn't describe you. I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to start praying about doing it. I want you to start praying about sharing the gifts you've been given. 
I know it's intimidating. I know it's scary. Matter of fact, I know some of you are sitting there right now and you're saying, well, Tim, I don't know. I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be sharing. I don't have anything. I don't have it. I'm telling you, if, if you're on the money thing, get off the money thing. I, I barely survive. Move away from that. If you don't know what it is you're supposed to be sharing, I'll tell you what. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to be praying about it this week. And I want you to come back next week because next week I'm going to help you discover what it is I think you're supposed to be sharing. And you may be sitting there and you may go, Tim, I just don't know, man. I just don't know there's I don't know that I have it in me. I don't know, I don't know that I can live that kind of life. I'm, I'm whatever, whatever your struggles are, whatever your shortcomings are, whatever it is. For some reason, you're just you're scared to death of it. I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to pray about it this week. And I want you to come back next week. And I'm going to show you what you're missing. Because you're missing. Will you do that? If you will, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I wish I had time. God, I wish I had time to go down the list. I wish I had time to sit here and name name after name after name after name of the people in my life and the people I've come across who stopped what they were doing, saw that there was something I needed, looked within themselves and said, you know what? I've got that. God, they shared it with me. And because of the gifts that I've been given, because of the gifts others have chosen to share I am where I am I live the life that I get to live I experience the love that you want for me but God you know each and every one of those people help me to thank some today but God you bless all of them Any other ones for me that paused and helped me when I needed it the most? You bless them. You let them know that their giving didn't go unnoticed. And Father, there's some people here. There's some people here and they do this and I see them do it and they know they do it and I am proud as all get out of them. God, help us to continue to do it more. Help us to see and recognize the needs that we can meet. But God, there's some of us here. And we know when we look at this story, we know that we're not doing it. We're not sharing. God, I pray that you'll begin to move those hearts, that you'll begin to change those hearts today, that they will be praying about what it is that they're supposed to be doing, what it is they're supposed to be sharing, who it is they're supposed to be helping, that they will begin to pray that, God, and then what we will see happen is over this next week or two right here, God, that you will chisel these hearts down and we will become a church full of people who share what we've been given Because that's how your work is accomplished. When we share, you move. God, I want to see lives changed. Help us, God, to be 
who you created us to be. Help us not to turn a blind eye to our neighbor. Father, we love you and we give you all the glory. I pray that you continue to move our hearts towards you. You answer the questions we have. You ease the fears that we have. And God, you lead us every single day. And it's in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Share. Love your neighbor. We'll see you next week.